please welcome the Chief Executive of the Professional Dance Corporation, Mr. Matthew Porter. It's quite the tale about you working Barry, isn't it? Just explain how this happened, because this is the sort of thing that if if you didn't know it was true, you'd think that's an idiotic script written for some drama on TV. Yeah, I suppose so. It's a bit it's a bit unusual, isn't it? If people say, what do you do? I don't actually say I work for Matrim or PDC, I say I work for Barry Hearn. You'd have the hairdryer treatment from mm. the late... Yeah, 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 have yeah, you ever yeah. got the hairdryer from Barry? Uh, twice, yeah. Twice? twice Can yeah. you reveal yeah. what they were about? So time? next time you see Stuart Pike, make sure <laughs> you tell him that if there's 180, 180s in the New Zealand Darts Masters, he has the same <laughs> $2 cheeseburgers. <laughs> because unfortunately Stuart wasn't 100% delighted at having to embrace this particular phrase. He'll come in after a weekend and he'll say, oh, so-and-so's climbed up and he's only 500 quid off now. He had a bad weekend and stuff like that. And you think, oh, all right, Basil, if you say, if you say so, no problem, you know. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's something that nobody else will ever be able to really do. I had to take Rod Harrington to the meeting with me because I was too young to make the decisions in their eyes. But, so, so Rod Harrington was like your Japanese elder? Right, yeah. So, <laughs> You know, and then I've gone back in there, oh, you won't believe what's happened. And he nearly gone, I know. And then he gone, I know. And, oh. and I'm like, what? What's happened? What's happened? I'm thinking, has something gone wrong? Yes, I missed the greatest leg of all time. Hello and welcome to another Dart Show podcast. A chance to have a more in depth discussion with one of the leading figures of the sport. And the figure this month is Matt Porter, the chief exec of the Professional Darts Corporation. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me, Dan, especially in these glorious surroundings. Yeah, it's fancy, isn't it? Lovely. And no expense spared. No, no expense uh, But you, you have got dressed up for Thank it, you. which yeah, is impressive. Yeah, yeah, standards. You're wearing, yeah, you're wearing a hoodie <laughs> half hour ago, but yeah, got true. dressed up for yeah. this, even though most people will be listening to this on audio anyway. It doesn't matter. Um, Chief Exec, it's a grand title, mm. Matt. What qualities do you have to have to be a Chief Exec of something like the PDC? Well, that's a good question. Um for me, that's a, it's tricky. I've gr I've kind of grown up with the PDC. You know, I started working for Barry Hearn in 2001, started working for the PDC in 2004. So I think maybe the qualities that I might be deemed to have now, I've got on that journey rather mm. than brought with me to the table, so to speak. Um, I think you look, you have to uh, you have to have an overarching picture. A lot of the time, the way I describe it is you may not necessarily be doing a lot of the work yourself. You're moving the chess pieces around the board, you know, and you have to make sure that, you, that everything's moving in unison and that everything's moving in the right direction. So it's, um, it's, 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 it's in increasingly less operational and more strategic as we grow, um, but still with that eye for detail because ultimately we're, we're judged on our events. So we live and die by the quality of our events. And, and if we don't have that eye for detail and that eye to keep improving them, then we won't progress. I mean, that kind of anticipates my follow-up question, which was going to be, did you have those qualities when you first started <laughs> out? Because how, how yeah. young were you when you first started working for Matchroom? So I was 21. I graduated from University of East Anglia on the 30th of June, 2001. And I started with Barry on the 2nd of July, 2001. So I didn't really have a gap year. I sort of had a gap, <laughs> gap day. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I started there at Lake Orient. And uh, three years after that, or maybe about 18 months after that, I started working on what's now called multi-sport. So mm. that was some of the snooker, nine ball pool, temping bowling, things like that. And then 2004, uh, on, onto the darts. Right. So it's quite the tale about you working for Barry, isn't mm. it? Just explain how this happened. Because this is the sort of thing that if, if you didn't know it was true, you'd think that's an idiotic script written for some drama on TV. Yeah, I suppose so. It's a bit it's a bit unusual, isn't it? I mean, I was so I always wanted to be a journalist and I was making quite good progress. I was I was working as a freelancer for a couple of agencies, mostly covering Lake Orient, but also other football in and around London. Uh, I was every week I was on what was then Capital Gold Sport, which was just a fantastic radio show, you know, the golden mm. era of, of um commercial radio sports broadcasting Jonathan Pierce was the lead commentator Dave Clark was there as well you know it was it was a really really exciting time uh, and then BBC London Sport grew at that time as well so I was I was fortunate enough to work on both of those to and be fair Matt you'd done well to like you would Still at uni at this point. Yeah, I was at uni in Norwich and I was sort of commuting. My mates at uni in Norwich thought I was mad because I was, they would say, well, which club should we go to this weekend? I'm like, no, I'm York away this weekend, you know, and I'll be getting the, the train from 
Norwich station at six o'clock in the morning to get because it was the only train that could get across that. I remember that journey across country to Peterborough. It ended up being quicker to come back to London and then go back up north, but <laughs> that was just soul destroying because you were wasting 150, 200 miles of travel. But anyway, look, I um, you know, I was I was still doing every Orient game. I had a little mini metro and I was driving back from Norwich to London and then back up again and then train to away games and whatever. And and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I had the option to go full time into radio, um, but at the same time, it was when the football league did uh, an overarching deal for their club websites. Most clubs didn't really have a proper website; it was mm. sort of turn of the turn of the millennium. And they did a deal with a company called Premium TV um, to centralise all, all their their digital inventory, and the websites all looked the same. And they started showing goal highlights, and the goal clips, the the highlights videos were like maybe like an inch wide on your screen, but it was unbelievable, <laughs> that, this pixelated coverage. But it was amazing that fans could see goal highlights on their club website and they could listen to audio commentaries and stuff like that. So it was really exciting. Um, and I, I just basically collared Barry at a Player of the Year do and said, I oh, hear you need a press officer for Lake Orient. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, we're going to recruit one. I said, oh, I'll do it for you. And he said, oh, okay, um, come down and see me. And he gave me the date and I got the train out of... It was nine o'clock in the morning. I was living in Norwich. So I thought, oh, going to early start. Another 6 a.m. train down to Liverpool Street, tube to Brisbane Road. Went into the uh, the old club entrance on the east stand side and I saw the lady who worked on reception. I said, I'm here to see Barry Holmes. She said, he's in the boardroom. So I knocked on, there was two boardrooms, an outer boardroom and an inner boardroom. And I went into the outer boardroom, knocked on the door for the inner boardroom and he said, come in. I opened the door and he was eating a bacon sandwich. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, I've come for the interview about the press officer job. He went, oh, yeah, go and see Dawson and sort it out. So Steve Dawson is the, was the finance director and still the group CEO of Matrim. So I was like, okay. And uh, that's the only job interview I've ever had. So, <laughs> I mean, just for a start, where as a 21-year-old, mm. to, and I know you were, you were down late in Orient regularly yeah, yeah, covering yeah, the football, yeah, yeah. but just collaring Barry Hearn, mm. who is a man who's got a presence and an aura yeah, about yeah. him, and saying... Listen, you want me to do this? Show. Didn't you tell him his match day program was rubbish? No, it was. I told the local paper that their Orient coverage was rubbish. Ah, right. Okay. So they said, "Do you think you can do better?" I said, "Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah." So I started doing the, their Orient coverage. Um, so it was. Yeah. Look, if you want to do something, you've got to put yourself in a position to do it, haven't you? If you sit there and wait for it to come to you, if you like have some sense of entitlement that people owe you something, then it's not going to happen. So if you put yourself in a position to make it happen, then it will happen. And it, it, sometimes it happens at different different paces but for me that just happened to be I was the right person in the right place at the right time because had the football clubs not been doing that with their websites or had I not been graduating from university at that same time I'd interviewed Barry a couple of times for I, I, was a, I did a fanzine I did a fanzine for Orient for a couple of years in the late 90s which was a lot of fun um, so I'd interviewed him for that I'd interviewed him for the local paper so he knew who I was roughly mm. like some gobby kid who was like telling him and I look back on some of the content I used to write back then and you think oh my god what oh, are you come saying on, yeah. What, like, yeah, what, were, you know, like, what was the content spend more money like all the players are rubbish like the <laughs> battery I remember getting dragged into the manager the manager was a guy called Tommy Taylor he was uh, you know it was a pretty well established lower league manager at the time and he'd had an excellent playing career uh, Orient won the FA Cup with West Ham and stuff like that and I just spattered him and, like, on, on tactics on my on my editorial. And I, I, look, I read it now. I've still got a copy at home. I read it. I think, oh, Matt, you were so far off the pace. <laughs> and it was about 2.30 on a Saturday afternoon. And the, the secretary at Orient came out. She said, I was selling the fanzine outside the main entrance. And she said, oh, the manager wants to see you. And I'm thinking, the game starts in half an hour. This can't be right. And he dragged me in his office and he gave me the biggest rollicking about you don't know anything about football, you kids, blah, blah, blah. But and from that day onwards, he was good as gold to me. And I, still, I, I messaged him the other day, he's, you know, Tommy's retired now, but he's a lovely man and he was, he was a good football person, you know, but I probably deserved it looking back. And it, it, it's funny because now the boot's on the other foot. Mm. And, you know, if I'm dealing with fans now, and, he, and what I would say is it's given me that empathy with them mm. because a lot of the time you're not trying to be malicious or, or destructive you just don't understand that world. Mm. And really, as a fan, you're not really supposed to understand that world because you engage with a club or a product on a different level, on a real just pure passion level. You know, So to not understand exactly how it works isn't a criticism. It's just the way it is, you know? That's interesting. So uh, was it always football? Darts wasn't, wasn't even no, on the radar No, I wasn't either. allowed to play darts as a kid because one of my dad's friend's sons was blinded by a bounce out. Blimey? Yeah, in a pub when he was when he was a young boy, I didn't know the boy, but he was my dad's friend's son, and um, so me and my brother were never allowed to play darts. 
Um, so we had a dartboard on the wall in like the sort of shed in the garden, but, but, it, just mold, but it just went mouldy. But it just went mouldy. I think when we got to like you know mid teens, we were okay with it. But as kids, we weren't allowed to play for that reason. Mm. I, I, you know, I get that. So um, yeah, it was. It wasn't a sport I really grew up with. Um, you know, would have started watching it on TV mid to late nineties. Um, but it wasn't until I went to the Circus Tavern in probably o two that I ever went to an event. Okay, so look, you start working for Barry. I mean, you've you've already had you'd had the hair dryer treatment from mm. the late. Yeah, 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 Have yeah, you ever yeah. got the hair dryer from Barry? Uh, twice, yeah. Twice. twice Can yeah, you reveal yeah. what they were about? Uh, so one of them was about. It was a really trivial thing. One of them was about Dean Smith when he was with us. Barry wanted him to play in his. But Dean Smith was a good cricketer. Barry wanted him to play in his cricket team for a day, but I'd organised the club thing on the day and Barry was furious that Dean couldn't play in his cricket match. He obviously really needed to win this cricket match. <laughs> so I got a massive telling off for that. <laughs> and then the other one was to do with um, to just, it was, it was, it was, again, it was really sort of messy. It was to do with um, some invitations for the world championship nearly 20 years ago. And it, it hadn't, that it hadn't come out the way that, Barry had intended it for it to come out in terms of the countries that we'd invited us. I can't right. really remember the detail, but it was to do with, he wanted some other players in it because I think we were maybe going to do a TV deal in those countries and they weren't in it. And then we'd done the draw, so there was no time to put them in it. It was back in the day when the system for putting international players in it wasn't as defined as it was now. It was a yes. lot more, should we say, liquid, you know, <laughs> and, and there was, you know, there was some, so there was a couple of players from countries who were going to show the event on TV and they ended up without a player in the event, and he was furious about that. But uh, fortunately, both of those were at least fifteen years ago. So. Right, okay. <laughs> He's mellowed a lot. He it, mellowed yeah, a lot. it wears yeah. off. It must be a very strange situation for a, a young person to go into match room because mm. it is. While it is, people might think match room or the PDC. Mm. Multi, multi million pounds running entire sports, doing TV deals across the world. Yeah. There are probably fewer people working in that match room Absolutely. office than there yeah, are yeah, in a, yeah. a medium Absol sized test. Yeah, I mean, when I say to people, oh, we've you know, we've grown, we've got 12 full time now, <laughs> they think it's going to be 120, you know, but it wasn't always like that. We used to have an office, a, a single story office in Romford, and I think when I started there, I was about the 14th person there, and that was it, you know, it was a little accounts department, a little post production TV department, and a, a small events team. And a, and a girl on reception. And that, that was Matrim at the time, you know. And we used to do boxing shows in the Goresbrook Leisure Centre for a Commonwealth title fight with 400 people. And we'd do, a you know, the Moscone Cup pool at the York Hall for 200 people. And, you know, it was just on a different scale. You know, the sports media business or the sports media landscape in this country has changed so much over the last 15 years. We've kind of positioned ourselves to be able to go along with that growth. Mm. Um, and, and we've been fortunate in that the sports that we've gone big in, darts, boxing, snooker, etc., are sports that have, have proven to be popular. Well, as it's grown and, and you've ended up doing bigger shows and travelling mm. all over the world, and obviously huge amounts of money, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. in darts, but the other sports yeah, in which you yeah, work. Yeah. Do, I mean, do you ever have doubts? Do you ever have like any kind of imposter syndrome going, what the hell am I doing yeah, here? Yeah, sometimes. And then I read things from people who've got fancy job titles and work for big organisations. I think you haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And that's really reassuring. <laughs> but a lot of the time, yeah, particularly being, a, particularly being generally younger, not so much now, I'm 43 now, but for most of the that's last... That's still young well, in yeah, my but book, for Matt. most of the last nearly 20 years, I was probably the youngest person in the room at a lot of those meetings. And... You, you have to learn, you know, you learn more by listening than you do by talking. So I'm generally a listener because that's how I've built up my knowledge and my experience and things like that. But use your eyes, use your ears and, and pick up the good bits from people, but also pick up the bad bits and just make sure you don't take them forward. You know, you, you have to know what the bad bits are to not do them yourselves. So with, with the growth that we've had, um, it's been it's been important to be able to make those decisions quickly, and you can only do that by learning from what other people do, whether it's right or wrong. What's it been like working with Barry? Because that man is a force of nature yeah. even now. He's, I mean, he's completely unique. He's completely unique, and you, you, I couldn't even begin to count the number of things I've learned from him. You know, and and almost all of them good as well. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but the the he just he, he gives you a platform to go and progress. You know, he's given me so many opportunities, and you you that that builds a loyalty and you feel like you need to deliver for him. So I think for me, it's just, it's just been, well, if people say, what do you do? I don't actually say I work for Matrimon or PDC. I say I work for Barry Hearn because that's what I've always felt I've done, you know? So 
um, yeah, it's it's, a, it's just it's just unique because I, look, I've seen back. You see him now, and he doesn't stop. He, he's even doing his tables for the dogs yeah, yeah, and all yeah. his yeah, rankings. It kills and stuff you on like it, the that. rankings. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he's cut, but he's always on the move. He's always on the go. Yeah. It, to be honest, you seem to be as well. I mean, I don't want this to turn into one of those podcasts yeah. where it's like, Diary of a CEO. No, I wake I'm up not, at four I, and eat flax seeds <laughs> and do a business deal. I definitely by don't do that. I definitely yeah. don't do that. No. But it's, I do it on a different level. See, I don't need to know what the challenge tour rankings are. That's, our media guys know what the Challenge Tour rankings oh, yeah, are. Do, and if yeah. I need to know what the Challenge Tour rankings are, I can go on one of our platforms and find out the Challenge Tours. So I would rather know something. I'd rather know what it was costing to hire the venue for the Challenge Tour weekend. But Barry's thirst for that level of detail, you know, he will come in, when, especially when it gets towards the race for Ali Pally. Mm. He'll come in after a weekend and he'll say, oh, so-and-so's climbed up and he's only 500 quid off now. He had a bad weekend and stuff like that. And you think... Oh, all right, Basa. If, if you say so, no problem, you know. But um, but yeah, that's that's something that nobody else will ever be able to really do. In terms of match working at Matchroom, mm. obviously you were because chief executive of PDC. You were chief executive late and early at the same time. Yeah, as I was. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you do those? Yeah, it was it was very different. I would say it was very different. I I, I could not do that now. You know. Right. So the darts at the time was almost exclusively UK. Mm. You know, there was we did little bits in Germany, and we started. To, I think we did a couple of World Series events by the time I, I exited Orient the first time. So um, it was very different. Orient was a much smaller club back then, not so much in terms of average number of fans or you know league position or anything like that, but just in terms of its all round operation mm. was smaller than it than it is now. And as I say, the darts was very much less traveling and a lot fewer events than it is now so it was it was doable it was tough and it was you know for a lot of that period of time I was a single guy or you know certainly not married and and I didn't have I wasn't a father so I didn't have those time pressures that you get now but it I would challenge anyone to be able to do it under the current circumstances but it was just about doable as it was before and I had support as well you know I mentioned Steve Dawson before he's he's kind of the numbers man at Matchroom and he's I couldn't operate without a good FD you know mm-hmm. as, a, as a CEO sometimes a lot of the time they're accountants themselves or maybe a lawyer themselves but so I'm more of an operations and strategic person so I need that support of somebody who can do the numbers you know when it gets to a certain level and luckily I had that support with me. Okay well uh, we know how hard Barry expects his staff to work. Mm. You've already detailed it. Um, however, there are rewards that come in, come with that. Mm. Uh, what's the most ostentatious and ridiculous place that Barry has taken you to eat or drink or do anything? <laughs> there must be some <laughs> mad stuff because Rod always used to. Rod Harrington yeah, yeah, yeah. always used yeah, to go on. Yeah, about. we've been lucky. We've been to some, you know, some really nice places and some special places. I mean, Barry's got a. You know, he's got a, a place in the Caribbean that I've been fortunate enough to, to have been out to. And that's, you know, that's very, very nice. But it's 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 not just about going to those places. It's about why you go there and what you do when you're there. You know, it's all about enjoyment for Barry. He does, everything's, a, everything's a real labour of love for him. And he wouldn't, he turned down so many sports and so many different things because he just thought he wouldn't enjoy them and wouldn't have the passion for them. And conversely, and that, he loves the ping pong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does, yeah. Although we don't do it anymore, but yeah, yeah I think he was sad. Um, but it, it's it's just about, it, it, it's, if you don't buy into it, then how can you deliver it to the best of your ability? So, yeah, we've had, we have had some great trips. I remember sitting on, there was about 15 of us, John McDonald was there entertaining us, um, and <laughs> we were sat on, on this outside table at a, a restaurant and, and in Hong Kong, and the boats were bobbing past, and the skyscrapers were there, were there in front of us, and this bringing out this fresh seafood. It, was, it wasn't it was like, it was like a six-star restaurant. It was just the occasion. Mm. You know, everyone was having a good time. We'd just done... Um, we'd just done the the you know the pool out there in the far east, and it was just really exciting. Best mm. place to go drinking out of all the places you've been in the world. Um, For a responsible drink. Um, well, it's, Vegas is a really obvious answer. It's an Re- obvious one, but it's not a bad one. It's not a bad one. No, Rapongi's pretty lively in Tokyo. Ah. That's that's a, that's a that's one that's a bit off the beaten track sometimes. And there's a, I think they call it the French Quarter in Shanghai, but. Uh, yeah, there's some well, there's you, some different places. You mentioned Japan and China. Mm. Um, how difficult has it been to go and put on events in far flung bits of the world yeah, yeah. where you've not only got language and various other mm. barriers, working within completely different systems for the for the work, mm. but there's social things there uh, as it's well. It's impossible. I mean, <laughs> China and Japan. I do. Like I, I have a lot of respect for our snooker guys because pre-COVID they were in China all the time. It's so difficult. 
You know, mm. it's, I mean, it's a wonderful country in so many ways, but to do business in, in China and especially Japan can be a big challenge. I remember one meeting we were doing, um, we were doing uh, an event at the Olympic Hall, the Yoyogi it's called in Tokyo, and we had to have a planning meeting and a half hour meeting in the rest of the world takes eight hours in Japan, right? And I was too, I had to take Rod Harrington to the meeting with me <laughs> because I was too young to make the decisions in their eyes. So, so Rod Harrington was like your Japanese elder. Right, yeah. So <laughs> we're sat at this table and the Japanese guys were on the other side. I'm on this side with Rod. And say the question was, I don't know, what time do you want doors to open? I'd say six o'clock. I'd turn to Rod and I'd say six o'clock. And Rod would look across the table and he would say six o'clock. And the translator would turn to the Japanese guy and say in Japanese, six o'clock. And the Japanese guy would nod. And then it was like this meeting went on for hours and hours and hours because everything, the, the level of detail is obviously phenomenal. And they're so um, picky about so many things. We had one time, we had um, the, jib, the jib camera, which is the camera with the big arm that swings across the, the, the front of the stage and the walk-on and the fans at the front. And we turned up to the event on the first day and they'd taken all the chairs out of the front in the arc. And they said, well, why, why have you done that? Uh, well, in, in case the camera falls on the fans' heads. And it's like, it's not going to do that. It's like, <laughs> if that's the case, why is there even a roof on the venue? You know, it's like the, the camera's not going to fall down. It's and then two hours later, you know, a thousand people have been involved in, the, in, the, in this discussion and we get the camera back up. And then we get, to, we get towards doors and I said, what time are the security arriving? says no security okay what if the fans i said the fans will drink a lot and someone might get lively so what what happens if if there's a problem and they said if there's a problem the president of the japanese darts association will go over to them and tell them they're disgracing their country <laughs> <laughs> and i said I, there was, I mean what answer can you give i just went okay that's fine well, there's no answer to we that. We should is be there? bringing that in over no, here, surely. I did say to Barry, he said, "How's it going out there?" I said, "It's good, Barry." Ali Pally, what you need to do? If somebody's had too much, you need to go over to them and tell them they're disgracing their country. I think they will be very receptive. Yeah, very receptive. Yeah, yeah. I think I, that that tournament out in Tokyo. I think I remember you saying because it must have been after one of those long meetings mm. where you said, "Well, normally, if if we have." I need people to tell me whether things that could be done. If if the answer is no, it's they fine. need tell to tell me because yeah, yeah. we can figure something That's out. That's right. But in Japan, there's this sort of honour thing where they don't they really don't want no. to say no. No, they say yes, we can't. <laughs> so, can you do that? Yes, we can't. I'm like, oh, I don't know. What does, what does <laughs> where, that mean? Where Which one's stand? that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it's a, it is. A, look, I, I'm not taking the Mickey out of the country. You know, it's a remarkable place, and it was the, the events were wonderful. I've never. I don't think we've ever done events where fans have put so much effort into their fancy dress. You know, and the atmosphere is tremendous. They 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 were mad. And they tied it up. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 And it, it'll be great. You know, post COVID, you know, we've got the Asian tour restarted now and stuff like that. It'll be great to take the World Series back out to that part of the world one day. Um, in terms of your biggest challenges, I mean, those are very specific ones mm. for specific events. Yeah. yeah I know yeah. COVID was yeah, probably yeah, the yeah. big one, but are, yeah. the, you know, are there any other that spring to mind where it's been a, a real. <sighs> You've been out of your comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely work. You know, working working somewhere where it's culturally different. Working somewhere, I, you know, I went to New Zealand for the day. Flew like it's twenty seven hour flight, eight hours on the ground. You saw four. I saw four venues. Came back again. The first venue we saw, there was a two foot gap between the bottom of the entrance doors and the floor, and the wind is whistling in. And I said to the bloke, "I'm not even going to go in. It's a waste of time." Went to the second one. It was a cattle market. It made the West Point Exeter look like Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking to myself, I've just been on a plane for more than a day. My plane back takes off in five hours. Please, please let the next venue be good. Unfortunately, then we found that you know, we found the right venue. But everything's a challenge. But if it wasn't a challenge, it'd be boring, wouldn't it? You know, so it's, it's so exciting to, to plan and then execute an event in a new territory because darts is such a ripe sport for development. And it's a sport that has got so much potential to grow in almost every corner of the world. And it's kind of our responsibility to make sure that it does grow. So if we if we just sit on our laurels and go, oh, yeah, we're really good in the UK, we're really good in Germany, we're doing well in the Netherlands and we're starting to do bits in Eastern Europe and Australia and whatever, great, let's just sit back and have a cigar. It's not really gonna it's not really gonna fulfil us, is it? You know, we've got to make sure that we can we can take on some new frontiers and 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 just give the dart, make darts a truly global professional sport because that's that's what it's got the potential to be. I mean, I'll certainly get onto that in a little bit more detail. But mm. what about your biggest successes? What are the things you've achieved so far which you look back on and are proud of or proudest of? COVID, without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. You know, that was 
the the effort that went in to keeping darts going during covid was just remarkable you know i mean the lads came up with the home tour concept just brilliant absolutely brilliant so innovative so creative and then so well executed obviously technical problems but of course you know the whole world's at home and then to put the events on to create those bubble environments and then to gradually get back to the behind closed doors events the small crowds and then you know to finish up with with a semi normal alley pally you know this that put years on me i mean it was just so challenging and every day like nobody knew what the rules were nobody knew how to follow them and then the people who were setting them didn't know how to how to you know how to prescribe them to you so you end up making your own decisions and you have to use common sense practicality experience all those sort of things but it that was that was remarkable to do that, I've got to say. But yeah, I mean, in those situations where you do feel like you're flying blind, mm. I mean, do you have a set of principles or anything that go Yeah, you? you just be honest. Because if you're honest with people, I always say this, I used to say this to fans at Orient a lot, you might not like the answer I'm going to give you about ticket prices or transfer policy or whatever, but if I'm telling you the truth, what can you do? You know, people generally get the hump if they think they're being lied to or having the mickey taken out of them. If you just say, look, this is the way it is, you know, and I'm being dead straight, then you generally get more respect and more understanding. So that's that's kind of the approach, really. Right, Matt, I want to talk about the state of darts. We've mm-hmm. already mentioned a fair few times. Yeah. It's growing. It's grown massively. I mean, it's almost unrecognisable mm-hmm. from when you first started working. Yeah. I mean, how how would you even sum up the change in the sport over the last 20 years? It's, it's, it has been completely repositioned in the market. Um, you know, a lot of that's been intentional by us, and a lot of it's been organic and just the way the events have grown, things like fancy dress. You know, we try and say, well, who's the first person ever to wear fancy dress to the darts? Why do they do that? And now everybody does it, <laughs> you know? So there's that. And the, and the way that the players have responded to the increased profile, the increased pressure, the increased prize money, the three Ps, as I've just invented, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't intentional. Um, but, you know, that, those, that, those factors. Yeah, look, when I started, players used to go on stage with an Umbro polo shirt and the Umbro sign was covered up by a sticker that had their mate's local business on it and their mate had probably driven them there and they put the sticker on as a favour. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's not a criticism of players from that era because that was what that era was Just about. How it was. That was what it was. You know, it was small money to the winner and it wasn't, you know, not not many of the guys were doing it full time for a living. There was only a handful of players, the likes of Phil and John Parr and Rod and people like that who were, you know, really pushing professionalism in darts going going forward and now you know the world number 450 has got his own logo nickname walk-on song and everything like that and that's because he wants to be in the premier league or at, in, at the world championship um and that's you know i think that's just testimony to the the desire to f- from these players to want to go on now and t- and be part of taking the game forward how do you think it's has it changed entirely for the better during that time I think so, but I know a lot of people won't. You know, I think there's a the, the, it's difficult with with whatever it is in life. If you've had it one way for twenty odd years or whatever length of time, and then something changes, you know, a football club might move to a new stadium. Fans don't like the new stadium. Mm-hmm. New stadium's way better than the old stadium. But fans like the old stadium. Um, you know, and in darts, you know, a lot of fans they don't like ten thousand crowds. They don't like it if someone's booing, mm. and they don't like it if a player's giving it some on stage or. Going, it, I mean, a few years ago, people used to get the ump when somebody went for two doubles as a checkout, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, I can you name know, a few players who yeah. think that was disrespectful. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then you, they come out and, and people would say in the interview, oh, I'm just here to play darts. And you think, well, so is the other bloke. He just, that was how he did the numbers, you know? And it, it's changed, doesn't it? And it everything changes. Look, everything changes in the world. It's an evolution. It's a journey. If anything stands still, it goes backwards. So it's it's like, don't, don't get the ump that something's changed. Embrace what it was before, but then put it there and then say, this is what it is now. Like, It's like if you split up with your missus, right? Don't be sad that you split up. Be glad that you had it. Do you know what I mean? There's different ways of looking at it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah no, that's interesting. Do you think the profile of the modern darts player has changed then? I mean, we've seen, you, we're, as we're chatting, there's a Premier League night about to mm. go on. We've got the likes of... Dimitri Vandenberg and Nathan mm, Aspinall mm, mm, mm. and you know, Gerwin Price is another yeah, one. Yeah, they, yeah. they don't look, they don't act, they don't have the same profile as darts players from even no, when you started. Uh, no, they don't. And and that's good because, you know, that's the way we're trying to take the sport forward. You know, we want these people to be, um, we want them to be people who the public can look look up to 
but in a way that they can still want to emulate or try to emulate them. You know, you watch a Premier League football match. Not many people watch a Premier League football match and think, I could do that. They're not relatable characters, are no, they? No, they're not. Nathan Aspinall you know, is the most he, relatable he is, yeah. character Nathan Aspinall is your mate in the pub, mm. you know, and that's great. There's a very that's... good chance Nathan Aspinall has been <laughs> your mate in a pub at some but, point. But that's great, isn't it? Because that's what people want, you know. And I mean, go and find me someone who's going to boo Michael Smith. No, forget it. No one's, no one's going to boo Michael Smith. He's one of the most likeable people you've never met, you know. So it's like th- these, these characters are what, is now taking the sport forward. You know, every year I asked the PDP, I said, send me the average age. I love this chart. Every year the average age is going down of, of, of tour card holders, of the top 64, the top 32, the top 16. And that's not saying there's not a place for players who've been playing for a long time. Of course there is. Mm. But ultimately, the guys who are coming in have to be younger, you know, and they have to be doing it differently. Um, They are doing it differently. It's all about creating opportunities but what and there's, there's loads of things you can point to as successes what do you think what are the things you look at in the game right now and go that is an area of concern that we might need to address for example say sponsors mm-hmm. i mean that we sponsorship's tough yeah. that is a tough one Spon- isn't it yeah sponsorship's tough i mean look we've always been very strong in particular markets and anyone who knows anything about our events will know what those markets are and that's great we embrace those markets we deliver to those markets you know but can we go and get sponsors of a, of a different level as well you know to prove that we are a sport that's moving forward. You know, I think it's it's important for us to open new doors for darts, you know, and there's, there's no reason why um, we shouldn't be, you know, a, a, a viable proposition for a lot of companies to sponsor. But a lot of them haven't got the vision to reject the old darts. Do you think there's you know, still that stigma? Yeah, there's that hangs definitely over still it. that stigma. If well, you've when you not talk seen to sponsors it, and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, if you've not seen it, it's lazy and easy just to assume that darts is what it was in the 80s or the 90s, you know, and it isn't. So I think that's our biggest challenge in, in the sponsorship market. I mean, do you, uh, obviously, there used to be tobacco sponsorship mm. and, and alcohol sponsorship mm. on a much bigger scale. Mm. Betting firms came in and filled yeah, that void yeah, when yeah, things started yeah, yeah. getting. I mean, do you anticipate, where's where's that next white knight sponsor? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, bet, the betting sponsorship market's still got a lot of life in it. You know, and the bookmakers are really good partners for us because they activate very well and they've got a very strong connection with our fan base. You know, so we're not, you see some sports and they're going to turn their back on on, on betting. And the main reason they're going to do that is because they can't manage it properly. Then it can it can deliver for everybody. Um, you know, but ultimately to, to survive, you have to move forward. So what else is there as well as betting partners, as well as vehicle partners and trade partners and stuff like that? Because those guys are, those guys are absolutely... 100% where we you know where we're seen to be as a as a as a, as a, a brand mm. where else can we be as well the Rolex UK open you never know you never know i mean <laughs> I, I think to be honest with you we're crying out for a timing partner timing is a hugely underused data aspect in darts you know people talk about slow players fast players the speed of a game ricky evans throws a 180 in 0.1 seconds whatever you know you never really see timing as 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 a, a proper stat in darts, do you? You know, no. and we, we include it now on our official score sheets because I asked for it to be included because I think it's the sort of thing that should be a talking point. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. To be fair, uh, with the chase tag that I do, the other mm. ridiculous sport that I do, mm. uh, we had an entire tournament sponsored by Zaxby's, which is a takeaway brand uh, okay. over in America, where I had to three times per episode uh, say indescribably good chicken. So if you if you could get anything like that, yeah, because yeah, while yeah. it is ridiculous, does make me smile. Okay? Yeah, just forcing presenters and commentators to say ridiculous things. So next it. time you see Stuart Pike, make sure <laughs> you tell him that if there's 180, 180s in the New Zealand Darts Masters, he has to say $2 cheeseburgers. Because unfortunately, Stuart wasn't 100% delighted at having to embrace this particular phrase. And I got to the point where I said to him, if you don't say the phrase, I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> so it's up to you what you want to do. And after then, the whole country in New Zealand knew it was $2 cheeseburgers. There you go. So there you go. Absolutely. Superb. And yeah. um, what about broadcasters? Because we're in a very, we're in a new era in broadcasting. Mm. It's not just the old ways of doing yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah. much more is streamed. Yeah. So much more you do yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole landscape is changing mm. and it seems to change Every year. It does, it does. It's very difficult at the moment to really predict where it's going to be in three, four, five years' time. You know, obviously we've been with Sky since day one. We've been with ITV for must be 15 years now at least. So, you know, they're, they're very, very strong sports broadcasters. They, you know, they, they 
deliver great production for us and, and uh, we, we deliver great audiences for them. So it's a really good marriage. But again, you know, you've got new partners coming in, Viaplay have come in and, and bought Premier Sports in the UK. They're our rights holders overseas. The Zona are a strong rights holder for us overseas. They're going to be on the Sky platform from next week. Uh, you know, who knows what Amazon, Apple, Netflix, et cetera, are going to do in the, in the sports market. So we have to stay nimble and we have to keep our finger on the pulse and make sure that we're still delivering a product that, that people want. Have uh, any of those discussions with the likes of Amazon or Apple taken place? No, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's not really, you know, it's not really like you don't go to them and say, oh, this is what we've got. You know, what, what, what do you want as, as, as transactionally as that? Mm. You know, it's, you have to see what their strategy is and then work out how you might be able to deliver for them. But that's not to say we're going to turn our back on our current partners. You know, it might be that it's different types of content. Um, you know, we were really pleased to be able to deliver the the eight boards from from Minehead, uh, the UK Open earlier this year. You know, after the first few minutes went a bit wrong, it was I thought it was a really strong couple of days worth of live streaming, and that to me was a really good example of increasing the breadth of our coverage because Pro Tours we have sixteen bo- sixteen boards. Now I'm not saying we're going to stream sixteen boards. But if we're only streaming two boards, that's a lot of matches that people can't see. Mm. And when there's an appetite for people to see that, do, you know, our direct-to-consumer product, the PDC TV, there's a market for that. So sometimes you say, all right, well, maybe we don't need a, you know, we don't need a, a broadcaster for certain content. We can just go straight to the fans. How important is it balancing who you're serving? Because obviously there's there is a hardcore of darts fans, mm. and there'll be subscribers to PDC TV and yeah, want to yeah, watch yeah. loads of stuff and just yeah. consume content. But the vast majority of, of mm. darts fans are casuals. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. tuning in for the worlds or the Premier League or yeah, the odd yeah, tournament yeah, here yeah. and there, just where it fits around, mm. where it fits in for them. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. how do you? How do we? Who are we marketing this sport both. to? We're marketing to both because you market on different levels. You know, you don't need to tell somebody who knows the Pro Tour format and rankings inside out that darts is sport's biggest party. You don't need. To, they don't really mm. want to know that. You know, what they want to know is that there's 27 countries in the world championship instead of 14 or whatever, you know. So you tell them, you tell different people different things, you know. But the person in the street who um, likes going to Ali Pali and knows that darts is on TV all Christmas and also the Premier League's going to their town, so maybe I should go twice instead of once. You tell them that it's sport's biggest party and you tell them that it's the best players in the world and you tell them that it's a million pound prize money or whatever because they're the headlines and that's what they go for. But then you have to tell the other people, the people who are waking up thinking about darts and going to sleep thinking about darts. You have to give them more because they've got more knowledge of the sport and more thirst for it. Okay. Um, This sort of leads into one of the things you already touched upon. With growing audiences, big crowds, it has changed the dynamic of going to a darts mm. event and fan behaviour comes mm. into it. Now, <clears throat> where what's is there an official policy or line of what you want from a darts crowd yes you want everybody there and enjoying himself yeah, yeah, but obviously yeah. it does lead to yeah, booing yeah. or unacceptable language or people getting mm. so drunk you yeah. might not it might not be as welcoming for everybody I, I i don't take it i don't agree that the the events are not welcoming for everybody because i think generally the atmosphere is created by the fans for the fans mm-hmm. and people enjoy people enjoy being in that environment you know and the number of people who cross the line is so small and if you in any specter of society if you put that number of people together a small number of them will cross the line mm-hmm. and then it's up to comes up to the organizer to, to manage that the question is where do you draw the line you know so do you draw the line at fighting well obviously yes that's not acceptable do you draw the line at booing no i don't draw the line at booing you know I, I, in a sporting event somebody buys a ticket they have a right to want a team or an individual to win and a right to want a team or an individual to lose. I don't want them to boo, but I'm not going to start saying we're going to close our doors because you're booing. It's one of the similar things I say if I talk with players and they're complaining about abuse they get on social media or mm. whatever. Yeah, it's not good and it isn't it's you know it's horrendous some of the stuff. Mm. But Imagine if you're a Premier League football player, because the scale of both yeah, of the crowd behaviour, the social media stuff is so wild that it's, you know, the last players' problems look very, very small in comparison. I, I agree. I think it's difficult because it's very endearing that a lot of our players are on social media themselves and it's part of that connection that they have with, with the fan base. But I'm not sure it's always the right thing for them to do, particularly in and around their matches. You know, I mean, the amount of times I've said to certain players... Don't go on social media after your match. Win, lose or draw. Just don't do it. No, I won't. No, I won't. No, I won't. And then a couple of hours later, you see something they're posting. You think, what What are you doing? 
what are you doing? You, like, social media is a horrible world. It's a hor- If I didn't have this job, there's not a chance in hell I would have a Twitter account. Not a chance. It's a revolting place to be. <laughs> but it serves a purpose in certain, in certain environments. So use it as a marketing tool. You know, and it's and it is it's nice to connect with with fans, and a lot of people are nice on social media, but a lot of people aren't. Mm. The other the other issue I wanted to address, actually, Matt, mm. does Darts have a diversity problem? I know we've gone to lots of different countries and everything, but despite the growth of the game, it's been largely it's still a, it's still a white mm. male, less male now. Yeah, to be yeah, fair, yeah, that, yeah. there's efforts <clears throat> made there, but it's still largely a white sport. It is, it? yeah, yeah. I, I guess so. It's certainly at the professional level. Mm. Um, I don't really know enough about why that is um i watched the uh, dita headman documentary i was actually part of it and devon was in it and dita and they both spoke very well um i'm not sure it really gave like any sort of definite strategy to solve to solve that problem if that mm. problem is is there and it, you know on on numbers ethnic minorities are massively underrepresented in darts um, and there's an appetite for it. I mean, look, you know, anecdotal evidence we know from when we go to cities like Wolverhampton and Leicester, where there's a large Asian population, we get a lot, a lot of ticket holders from 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 that, you know, from that community, um, but no players, mm. you know, and no players at the top level anyway. So, um, I don't know whether it's going to be part of the journey of professionalism of darts that it will naturally evolve, like it is doing with women, like it is doing with younger players, um, or whether it's something that something's going to have to be proactively done. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't feel like I know enough about it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's... It, it, but it's it's obvious from just from watching darts that there's an underrepresentation. I mean, there's, that's particularly, say, let's take the example of British Asians. Mm. I mean, if you look at the number of British Asians that have played football, I think it might have been... Might have been a couple of guys who played Orient over the years, but there's very, very few mm. in terms of numbers, and that's you would think that's something that happens, yeah, would have happened yeah, naturally yeah, with yeah, the popularity yeah. of the sport and everything. But I mean, would you rule out making steps to try and get into new communities? Well, one thing I would say is I think you've got to be careful to do anything that's too artificial, too planted, because people see right through that, you know. And I'm not sure people would necessarily even want to be involved in it because if it's just you don't want tokenism and you don't want something that's just done almost forcibly. You know, if there's an appetite to get involved, then let's foster that appetite. Let's harness that appetite and, and let's, you know, let's try and in- increase the, the representation. But I think for us just to plonk something in, it's a bit like with the, with the women's situation, you know, when we, it, it's different now with the women's series and the women's match play and there's there's far more structure to, to the professional end of the women's game. But when at first we just just put a woman in, you know, it's mm. it's very. It doesn't feel like it's the way it should be. Mm. You know, it should be. It should be driven by the participants, by the the ma- the masses, for want of a much better word. You know, but but bottom up. Yeah, it's just well, it, but it always is. Down. You know, I mean, look, I always say to people, putting a, a woman in the world champion, an extra woman in the world championship, when they ask me about the number of places, it's great for that woman and her friends, and they all go, everyone goes, well done and stuff like that. But it's not really great for the hundred and fifty others because what the what what's the the benefit to them? You know, so I'd, that's why we'd rather create a bottom up uh, structure with the women's series. We're now doing twenty four events. Prize money's gone up. Women's World Match Play giving eight women the chance to play on TV. Plus, as well, don't forget they can all play in the main system as well if they want mm-hmm. to. Go to Q School, Challenge Tour, Development Tour, and ultimately Pro Tour. So by creating those opportunities, that's what will stimulate. The, the the interest levels obviously Fallon winning her her matches at the World Championship was a was a, a seminal moment and that would have hopefully inspired a lot of either women who played a little bit to play more or women otherwise to pick up a set of darts for the first time you know because they could see could see what could happen but the fact that and I've said this many times the fact that women can play against men at darts is such an asset for the sport and that's something that we really need to 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 be encouraging so we'll do women only. Uh, events to get the participation increased but then once it gets towards the top level then we really want to see you know the 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 combination of men and women playing together um you mentioned at the start of this chat about how you know the pdc nowadays is kind of the stewards of the of Mm. the sport yeah yeah so is there a grand vision? Is there a plan, a roadmap of, of where you want to be with time scales or anything or yeah. things that you're looking to achieve? So time scales for me, for anything new, are always five to ten years. Always. You know, and, and that you can see that now from the number of 
players from the development tour, which is about 10 years old, who've come through to play on the pro tour and qualify for the world championship and stuff like that. So it's, it's, you can't look at it and say, right, well, we're going to bring this in and then next year everything's going to be great because it's not going to work like that. It has to be a slow process. So same with women's darts, uh, same with new countries that we go to. You know, it's no good going there in year one. You might sell a load of tickets, but ultimately if you're just doing one weekend a year, it's not really leaving a legacy. It's not really going to grow the sport. You've got to have local content, local activity. Um, and it's a long-term process. So I think we're well on the way. We've, we've established a proper structure now, a proper structure of, 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 a, of tours and supporting tours beneath them, whether they're part of our global affiliate tours or whether they're the, the secondary tours we have here in the UK and, and Europe. So we've got that structure, which is pretty well rounded now I think there's there's not many people who could say they wouldn't have an opportunity to get within the structure somewhere along the line um, so now it's finding like I said before new countries new frontiers and, and making darts like golf or tennis where if you're a professional player you're playing globally oh, so go on then give us some exclusives where are we looking where, where's new where's new <laughs> well look I mean Asia's such a big potential market for us you know you've been out there we've seen the, the number of uh, the number of Amateur players is phenomenal. You know the demographic is phenomenal. All ve like young players, men and women playing together. Um, a lot of it's soft tip, but it's changing because they're seeing what steel tip opportunities can be. And obviously, it took a while for for Asia to sort of restart in a sporting way because of COVID. But this year, with the Asian Tour being back up and running, that hopefully can be a kickstart now. So we can really look towards that, the Asian Championship, and then. Uh, if we can start getting the World Series back up and running out there as well in some way, shape or form. So that's strong. Um, Eastern Europe is becoming stronger for us. America and Canada have obviously got huge, uh, again, huge darts communities that, that can be leveraged. And then we look at new markets as well. South America, Africa, let's we'll just do little bits just to get started, you know, just to see what see what the numbers are like, see what the standards are like. But you can't expect... Um, you know, you can't expect what's the phrase Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, so let's let's give it a few years and make sure that we're always prepared to change if we don't feel it's right. Don't just say, well, this is what we're doing. If it's not working, we we'll change, we we'll do something else. One of the questions that I've, I've asked a number of people, and I'm interested to get your take on it, particularly from your perspective, mm. um, in the entire time that you've seen darts grow, or the mm. vast majority of the time, yeah. It was people were tuning in to see the greatest player that's ever lived, Philip mm, Power Taylor. Mm. And after that, we're tuning in to see the bloke who might be the greatest mm. player ever lived in yeah, Michael Van yeah, Gerwen. Yeah, yeah. Two guys who are unquestionably doing things we'd never seen before. Yeah. We're not in that position now. We've got better strength in depth yeah, than ever. Yeah, yeah, and it's more competitive. Yeah. We're seeing yeah. different people win, new winners, mm. first on winners all over the place. Which do you think is better? from your perspective, in terms of growing the sport worldwide? Um, that's a good question, and I'm going to cop out and say it's a blend of the two. Because, <laughs> but it, look, Phil retired. Had Phil retired five years earlier, I think we might have had a problem. Because five years before Phil, there wasn't that group of personalities that were as well-known beneath him. But when he retired, and even though he lost that world final, he'd won the match play, went out on such a, you know, such a, a cloud, if you like, such a, a pedestal. Um because the sport was ready to move on without him, you know, and it was like PDC 2.0, you know, Phil's gone, Phil built the PDC, what he did took darts beyond where it was before because everybody knows who Phil Taylor is, you know. Um, and then, as you say, for a while, everybody knew Michael Van Gerwen was, and obviously people still do, but there's now a list of a dozen, 16 players or whatever, who everybody knows who they are as well. And that's testimony, not only to them, but to where the sport's gone. And it shows the power of the event, you know, I look within Matchroom, I look at our boxing guys and a boxer will pull out of a fight the day before or a couple of weeks before and the whole show pretty much collapses. You think, okay, so let's say we're at, uh, I don't know, Leicester or Blackpool or wherever and Michael injures himself the day before the event. The event goes on. The event will still be great. You know, so we've got that strength that the event is the king. The event is 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 the, the focal point. And the players are the, the, the lead actors. I'm not going to start going down metaphorical cul-de-sacs here but ultimately <laughs> if one of them drops out they've got an understudy mm -hmm. you know and that's so important for the for the sport because that's what we're selling we're selling the event we're selling the experience um it, we are selling an event and it's important for the x thousand number of mm. fans that are there um it's a tv event and arguably i mean the majority of, of money comes from tv deals yeah, doesn't yeah, it yeah, yeah. so and it's one of those things we were told all the way through covid with the football 
the fans are what make it. Well, mm. it turns out they could carry on without the fans. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah, didn't yeah, matter yeah. at all. But yeah. that, they do do matter, though. They don't do they? matter. I mean, you know, we we did a year, didn't we? We did every event once without fans, and that was enough. You know, it was it it was novel, and it, there was no choice. But obviously, it isn't what you wanted. You know, and again, you talk about artificial things, artificial crowd noise, and you know, we tried to dress the venues and things like that. But it wasn't the same. I would rather have a full 3,000-seater arena than 6,000 people in a 15,000-seater arena. You know, the atmosphere is created by the density of the fans inside the venue. It's the same in any sport. So you have to you have to sell your, your tickets. You have to get your bums on seats. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what generates that atmosphere, that intensity. And the fact that they all come to enjoy themselves. You know, people don't go to football to enjoy themselves. People go to football to moan. Trust me, I'm one of them and I watch thousands of them doing it all the time. People don't go to football and go, I'm going to have a great day today. They go to football and they go, ah, oh, these idiots, they're going to lose again. I've wasted my money. I'm you know, a county fan. I know, yeah. I, know what it's like. I know what it's like. But, you know, it, look, I'm being slightly facetious, but you, you get my point. They come to the darts and they come to enjoy it because ultimately they don't really care who wins. And they're coming for a social occasion as much as a sporting occasion. It's a night at the darts. It's a night at the darts. Yeah. 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 All right, then. Personally speaking, mm. football or darts? Um, football. As a, as a punter? Yeah, as a, uh, no, as a person. As, as a, a person. person. I, lo- I mean, I was brought up with football. I love football. I, I think I love darts, but I love football more because everybody loves football more. You know, it's just what... I don't anymore. I've gone the other way. I was always football. Listen, Orient are six points clear at the top of League Two. What do you want me to say? Yeah, yeah. Look, and we're, we're, we're chasing Wrexham, so it doesn't No, look, I, look I, lo- I love darts. I can't play darts particularly well. I'm not saying I can play football particularly well, but I I, I, I was brought up with football and I'll die with football, you know? Um, for me, darts is is more than a job, but it, football's, football's, football's football. Well, sod football, I don't care about football. Um, what are <laughs> you might your, win the playoffs. What, yeah, what, what are your, from the darts side of things, your favourite memories, tournaments, matches, anything, the um, things you've experienced while working in this game that has stuck with you? I, I was stood right next to the stage when uh, Barney played Taylor in 2007 at, at the Circus Tavern. And that's still quite early on in your... It was, yeah, it was. But I remember I stood there, there was Steve Mottis who was with Phil at the time and Ed Van Der Veer who was with Barney at the time. And I got on pretty well with both of them. And one of them stood to one side of me and the other one stood to the other side of me. And I was sort of having to cheer both players because I was whichever way I was looking to both of them. That was a, that was a tremendous moment. I mean, look, what I would say about darts is the spectacle of darts is better than most football spectacles because that environment that's created is so unique, you know. So I think when you look at memories, they're all going to come down to things like some of the Premier League walk-ons that we had, you know, whether it was Doby in Newcastle or Hendo in Aberdeen or, um, you know, when uh, I was at Wembley when uh, when Phil had his nine darters against Wadey, mm-hmm. when... Gezi had his two nine darters in Belfast when Michael had his seventeen perfect darts. You know they're all they're all moments, aren't they? It's mm. like when you know if you talk about it in football, it's which goal was the most memorable or whatever. So it's not so much you don't remember like a day. You don't say oh yeah that Wednesday in Blackpool I was there for was, that was, moment. Was, yeah, but then during the greatest leg of all time, I was sat at the back having my dinner. So you I missed, missed the greatest leg of all time at Ali Pali. Hang on, who who told you it happened? Did, you probably didn't even know anything was going on. I knew on. There was, you could tell there was a nine dart, but you couldn't really tell because it was just loads of cheering and then loads more cheering. And I'm just, I'm just having my dinner thinking I'll pop back in and watch in a minute, you know. And then I've gone back in, oh, you won't believe what's happened. And he nearly got nine dart, and then he got nine dart, and, then, oh. and I'm like, what? What's happened? What's happened? I'm thinking, has something gone wrong? Yes, yeah, so I missed the greatest leg of all time. I missed the greatest leg of all time. In the same way, I missed the goal that got Orient promoted in 2006. I'd watched the whole season and I went back in to see whether Grimsby and Northampton had gone level, which would have got us up anyway. Came back out, Lee Steele had scored and we'd gone up. So if you ever need the best moment in my sporting career that I've actually seen, it's about the fifth (laughs) down the list anyway. (laughs) Well, I mean, mean, ultimately, Karma has has come back and rewarded you by seeing Andrew Gilding crowned UK Open champion though. So there you go. Uh, We'll wrap this up uh, because as soon as you leave, um, this will turn into the greatest podcast that anybody has ever seen. Let's hope so. Uh, Matt Porter, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.